circulating um, in the brain. It goes from the lateral ventricles to um, through the foramen of Monroe to the third ventricle, which is right here, and then from the third ventricle through the aqueduct of Sylvius, um, then to uh, the fourth ventricle, um, and then from the fourth ventricle, it goes down and around the brain through the foramen of Monroe, the foramen of Lushka, uh, I'm sorry, the foramen of Magendi, foramen of Lushka, um, and it's out around the brain um, and the spinal cord. CSF, um, again, is uh, the, um, that liquid in the brain. It provides nutritive value for the brain. It's actually made at um, 25 ml per hour every hour, um, and it's actually um, supposed to be reabsorbed at that same rate. We have arachnoid villies that we talked about earlier um, that actually reabsorb CSF. Okay? If the arachnoid villies are not working, CSF cannot be reabsorbed. Um, if you have blockage in any of these areas, let's say you have a tumor that's made in the lateral ventricles and actually is obstructing um, flow from the lateral ventricles um, to the foramen of Monroe, then you have what we call obstructive hydrocephalus. Um, a lot of times we can, um, uh, a lot of kids are born with a very, um, the aqueduct of Sylvia, so you look at it here, it's very narrow, and they can have strictures um, in the aqueduct of Sylvia that can actually cause um, CSF not to be um, able to circulate down because of the stricture in the, um, the um, aqueduct of Sylvius, which is another obstructive type of hydrocephalus. So you can have two types of hydrocephalus. You can have obstructive hydrocephalus, um, which um, cause um, a non-communicating hydrocephalus, and then you can have a communicating hydrocephalus where everything is open. The foramen of Monroe is open, um, the third ventricle is wide open, um, the um, uh, aqueduct of Sylvius is nice and open, um, the fourth ventricle is open, and everything um, flows, but you have um, in the arachnoid layer where you have those arachnoid villies, um, they are covered with blood, or if the patient has a meningitis, um, they're covered with pus, and that um, stops them from reabsorbing the CSF. Now again, remember, CSF is made in the brain at 25 mLs per hour every hour. It has to be reabsorbed at the same rate. If this is flowing, uh, and you have an issue where CSF is still not being reabsorbed because the arachnoid villies are clogged off and they can't reabsorb CSF, then that's a communicating hydrocephalus. So we have two types of hydrocephalus that can occur due to the ventricular system not working properly. Um, we have the um, obstructive hydrocephalus or non-communicating hydrocephalus where you have a blockage in the ventricular system, um, some part in the ventricular system, and then you have a um, a communicating hydrocephalus or non-obstructive hydrocephalus where the arachnoid villies can't reabsorb CSF, okay? And that can in, um, result in the ventricular system enlarging um, and causing more pressure or causing pressure on the, um, the brain, um, which can cause patients to have um, neurological compromise, okay? Now the plumbing, okay? The plumbing is very important. I'm going to go through um, the vascular structures so we can talk about a little bit more about the plumbing. Okay, um, you have uh, the aorta here, and off of the aorta you have um, the right internal mammary, uh, mammary um, artery. Okay, and off of that you can have um, the subclavian artery that comes off and goes up into the back of the brain. Okay, um, the subclavian artery comes up and goes into the back of the brain, and then um, causes uh, the um, vertebral arteries. Okay, we'll talk about that in a minute. Then in the front of the brain, you have um, the, um, off of the aortic arch, you have the common carotid artery that comes up and bifurcates into the internal and external um, carotid artery. The internal carotid arteries goes up into the, um, the um, cranial vault and actually bifurcates into um, the um, MCA and the ACA, and um, you also have the PCOM that comes off of the, um, the um, internal um, carotid artery. That's the frontal circulation. So you have front circulation and then you have back circulation, okay? So you have the vertebral arteries that um, is in the back um, that comes up, 
um, goes into uh, the cranial bulb. Um, the vertebral arteries um, merge to form the basilar artery. So again, you have a vertebral artery on the right, you have a vertebral artery on the left, vertebral artery near the right um, and the left come up and then they merge to form the basilar artery. You have um, the common carotid artery on the left and on the right um, that comes up into the um, cranial bulb. Um, you have a external carotid artery that comes up into um, the face. Um, it's outside of the cranial bulb, and then the internal carotid artery, which is inside of the cranial bulb, um, and that forms the um, frontal um, um, perfusion for the brain. So this might be a better picture, okay? So again, we have a vertebral artery on the right, and vertebral artery on the left. They come up, and they actually form the basilar artery, which is this big structure right here. Okay. The basilar artery is, and the vertebral arteries make up the back circulation of the brain. Okay, so off of the vertebral artery, you have the basilar artery. Off the basilar artery, you have the anterior um, inferior cerebral artery, and then you have the um, uh, the pontine arteries. These are just small perforating arteries that come off. Then you have the superior cerebral artery. Um, which is up, um, comes up here, and then you have the posterior cerebral artery, which is a big um, artery that comes up here. The posterior cerebral artery, if you look right here, you will see this is a posterior communicating artery that comes from the front circulation of the brain and actually joins to the um, posterior cerebral artery to actually form this area right here. Now, for the front circulation of the brain, we have the internal carotid artery on the right, internal carotid artery on the left, they come up, um, they uh, merge and form the middle cerebral artery. Off of that, you have, uh, actually they come up, the internal carotid artery come up, and then you have, um, off of that, I'm sorry, you have the anterior cerebral artery, um, communicating artery, actually, I'm sorry, anterior <laughs> um, cerebral artery that um, comes off of the internal carotid artery, and then you have the posterior communicating artery that comes off of the internal carotid artery, and then you have the middle cerebral artery that actually, um, it, it's like an extension of the internal carotid artery, okay? Now, you have the posterior communicating artery that comes to the back, then you have the anterior um, cerebral artery that comes to the front. The anterior cerebral arteries, one on the right and one on the left, are merge or join by the anterior communicating artery. If you look right here, that joins the anterior communicating artery. Um, now you have the anterior communicating artery joined here. Um, again, you're gonna have the anterior cerebral artery on the right, anterior cerebral artery on the left. You have the uh, PECOM on the right, or posterior communicating artery, PECOM on the left. But this all, posterior communicating artery, middle cerebral artery, anterior cerebral artery, and anterior communicating artery, all make up the front circulation of the brain. And these actually join together to form the circle of Willis. This is the circle of Willis here, okay? Uh, and this circle of Willis is what is responsible for that collateral circulation that the front um, circulation, the frontal aspect of the brain has, okay? Um, your middle cerebral artery actually feeds the lateral two-thirds of the brain. Uh, the anterior communicating aura um, the anterior cerebral arteries actually feed the medial one-third of the brain, okay? and then the posterior communicating artery um, comes back um, and actually joins the front circulation to the back circulation of the brain. Okay? Um, the basilar artery sits right atop the brain stem. Okay? Um, so, and if you look here, you have some perforating arteries that come off the basilar artery, but you don't have any type of collateral circulation here. So if someone comes and has a clot right here in the basilar artery, you're taking out a little big chunk of brickle right there. You're taking out brickle um, because you're taking out the brainstem. And we said that a brainstem holds most of the cranial nerves. We talked about the medulla housing respiratory function, vasomotor function. We talked about heart rate, blood pressure, all housed in the um, basilar arteries. So that's something that we really have to think about because if this is um, cut off, then we're losing um, circulation um, to a really vital aspect um, of our uh, brain. And this area here doesn't really um, 
clot off easily because it's actually a big vessel. Look at how big it is, you know? It's really a big vessel. So usually this gets clotted off. This usually is a very serious medical emergency. Not that all the brain is not, but this is a prickle here, okay? So you wanna make sure that that stays open. And that's what feeds the brain stem here. Okay, so we have these area here, com um, posterior communicating artery, that actually feels some of the occipital lobe, um, and actually can feed a little bit of the um, cerebellum. The superior um, cere um, cerebral artery um, actually feeds the cerebellum. Um, some of the um, basal artery that comes up, you have the basal tip. And when you have aneurysms, a lot of times they occur at these bifurcations here. So you can have an aneurysm here, you can have an aneurysm here, you can have an aneurysm here, you can have an aneurysm here. At these bifurcation air, um, bifurcating areas, you can have an aneurysm here. Um, that's usually where you see aneurysms because that's where the most of blood is like pulsating where the two arteries form. Okay? Homunculus man, you all see this. Remember we talked about the motor cortex? Uh, being at the back of the frontal lobe and the somatosensory cortex being at the front of the parietal lobe. Um, if you look here, this is a homunculus man um, that um, corresponds with the motor cortex. So if this patient comes in and he has a stroke, um, and the stroke is in the middle um, of where the cerebral hemispheres meet, and it's right around here, and that's probably anterior cerebral artery that's actually going to uh, uh, feed this area here because remember the anterior cerebral artery feeds the medial one-third of the brain, and it takes out this area here, he may have just weakness in the foot, and the arm may be just totally fine, okay? It's just the anterior cerebral artery that's not, uh, uh, damaged there, okay? Um, this corresponds with the area of the brain that will be affected on a motor aspect due to lack of perfusion or compression or something like that. And now over here in green, where you see the somatosensory area, you have the area uh, for homunculus man, again the same, tongue, teeth, face, nose, finger, all the way down to feet. The feet is what actually comes down in the middle here, just like here, and this is what controls sensation. So if this person has numbness and tingling in uh, the thumb, this is where it actually is, right? comes up and the thumb, and maybe right around, somewhere around here, is where they're actually having that, um, that, um, that compression or lack of perfusion, okay? Usually it's not that remedial, it's not like one thumb that's having um, that area. It's usually a lot more than that because the vessels are, uh, are large and they can feed a um, lot of um, aspects, um, various aspects of the brain. But this is just like a rudimentary um, area. If you have impulses that come up because you hit your thumb, let's say you were pounding something and you pound your thumb, um, what's going to happen is you're going to send that information up to the um, somatic um, sensory area to actually feel the sensation in that thumb which is actually gonna send um, an impulse to the motor area to actually tell you to move your thumb away from that impulse so that you don't keep hitting your thumb over and over again. So that's kind of um, what the homunculus man does, okay? Now we're gonna talk very crudely about the spinal cord. Um, your spinal cord is made up of um, your white matter and gray matter, just like the brain. Brain has white matter and gray matter. I didn't talk about it, um, but just um, this lecture precludes going into all that. Um, but we have the posterior horns and the lateral horns of the spinal cord. Um, and basically, um, <clears throat> the spinal cord takes information from the body and sends it up to the brain um, drew, through the, um, the spinal um, tracts um, that actually take information from the brain um, to the spinal, um, the, uh, the body, and then from the body to the brain. We have the cortical spinal tract that actually is the primary motor um, um, tract that takes information from to the motor cortex, and then we have the somatosensory tract that takes information um, from, um, or the spinothalamic, I'm sorry, tract that takes information um, from the somatosensory area. And that's basically what we're going to talk about. We're not going to go into really the, um, the um, intricate aspects of this, um, the tracts. I just need you to remember the cortical spinal tract is really the primary motor pathway, and the spinal thalamic tract is the primary um, sensory pathway. Um, and that's the putting it very mildly, but that's what we're going to do for now. Okay? 
uh, <clears throat> remember that um, uh, a sensation is originated in one aspect of the brain and it's actually um, um, sent down um, and actually bifurcates through this pyramid um, dissertation area um, that actually sends the impulse um, to the opposite side of the body. That's how our body functions. Okay. Upper motor neuron disease versus lower motor neuron disease. Anything in the upper neuro motor neuron disease is on the central nervous system. Uh, the lower motor neuron disease or peripheral nervous system. So if someone has a herniated disc and it's in the lower part and it's compress compressing a nerve root, that's a peripheral nervous system or lower motor neuron disease. If someone has a um, herniated disc and it's actually pre um, pressing on the brain stem, that's upper motor neuron disease. It's not pressing on the nerve roots, but it's actually pressing on the brain, the spinal cord, I'm sorry, not the brain stem, the spinal cord itself. So if we're looking at something pressing on the spinal cord or the brain, we're looking at upper motor neuron. If we're looking at something pressing on the peripheral nervous system, um, then we're looking at, or the peripheral nerves, we're looking at lower motor neuron disease, okay? Upper motor neuron disease versus lower motor neuron disease. Upper motor neuron disease, patients have spasticity and rigidity, okay? They have increased um, reflexes with upper motor neuron disease. Um, they'll have um, abnormal reflexes, such as things like clonus, where you actually put their foot against your hand and it actually has abnormal beats. They can have things like Hoffman's, where you actually flick their finger and their whole hand um, uh, corresponds. That's a, uh, a signal of an upper motor neuron disease. And then you have lower motor neuron disease, where you have um, flaccidity, um, loss of muscle tone, um, weakness. Okay, So you have spasticity and rigidity with upper motor neuron, and then uh, a weakness, um, well, um, distal to the lesion. So when you're looking at um, any um, um, lesion um, in the spinal cord um, or the brain, let's say um, I have a cervical herniated disc, um, what usually happens is, uh, and it's at, let's say it's at about C6. If it's at about C6, C6 is um, responsible for biceps. Um, and if you have to look at where C6 innovates, how far down, everything below where C6 innovates is going to have symptoms, okay, can have symptoms, not, not necessarily is going to, but can have symptoms. So usually um, you will have the symptoms below wherever that lesion is, okay, so the higher up the lesion, the more you have damage, the lower down the lesion, the less you have damage. So if it's in the um, thoracic spine, everything below is going to go. If it's in the cervical spine, everything below can be, um, it's fair game. Okay, so everything below the uh, level of the lesion is what's going to be in, um, affected. Okay. Um, this is the spinal col um, column. You have seven vertebral um, columns in the spinal cord. You have 12 thoracic, five lumbar, and five um, fused um, sacrum and then three coccygeal. Now, look at this. You have eight cervical nerves, okay? You have seven cervical vertebrates, but you have eight cervical nerves. Why? Because we have seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, but first cervical nerve comes up and over. And because that comes up and over, C8 comes down below C7. So you actually have eight cervical nerves, okay? And you have seven cervical vertebras, okay? Then you have actually 12 thoracic nerves and 12 thoracic vertebras. You have five lumbar nerves and five lumbar vertebras. And then you have the sacral um, um, fuse, um, coccygeal um, and sacral areas, okay? Um, <clears throat> see, um, when we talk about areas that are damaged and what we're going to see we have a c4 injury uh, c4 injury you're going to have tetraplegia uh, everything below that level where c4 innovates is going to be gone c6 can also be tetraplegia anything below that t6 paraplegia it's actually below the press bone and then l1 lesion um, paraplegia is below that um, belly button area here okay uh, <clears throat> very important to know 
T5 or T6 uh, comes right around the nipple area, okay? T10 goes right uh, at the belly button area. L1 uh, uh, right down um, at your groin area. Okay. The dermatomes, um, these are the things that usually um, a lot of people get <coughs> so um, crazy about. Um, very important to know what dermatomes are innovated where. Uh, why? Uh, we need to know that because if we know this, then we can actually depict what type of injury this person has based on the symptomology that this person is uh, exhibiting. Okay. Your autonomic nervous system, um, you have a parasympathetic and your sympathetic. I'm not sure I have another one in here that talks about the dermatome, so let me go back a little bit. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> if you look at here, T5, T6. Um, Actually, this one's a little bit lower, but if you look at T5 right here by the, um, the nipple area, T10 just below the belly button area, um, L1, um, you'll look right at the area here, that's where you're going to actually feel the symptoms, okay? Um, those are just like crude areas that we want you to pay attention to, okay? Now, when you're looking at your patient who comes in um, complaining of neck pain, you want to know, okay, um, where is the pain exactly, and what kind of symptoms they're having. If this person comes in complaining of neck pain, and they're telling you that the pain goes down the arm, stops um, right at the deltoid area, um, and they can't lift their arm at the deltoid area, and they also have numbness and tingling area in that area, you're looking at probably a C5 injury, okay? Uh, the C6 injury, basically, if you come down, and you're saying, okay, well, it's right here um, in my uh, bicep area and comes down and implicates my thumb, then you're looking at uh, a C6 injury, and so on and so forth. So I just wanted to highlight that. Your autonomic, um, and we're gonna go into those a little bit later on too. Your autonomic nervous system, made up of your parasympathetic nervous system and your sympathetic nervous system. Remember, your sympathetic nervous system is your fight or flight, okay? Um, everything you want to think about, um, anything that your body is going to do in a um, emergency type of situation. Your heart rate's going to speed up. Um, this is where you're getting with uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine release. Your body, uh, all the blood flow is going to go to your brain and your heart. Um, your body is going to say, well, you don't need to eat. So your bowels are going to shut down, okay? Um, you're going to say that you don't need to pee or poop, so you don't, um, you hold on to your um, urine, you, know, you don't poop on yourself. Um, think about it this way, if you're in the uh, middle of a fight, you don't want to pee or poop on yourself. So all those things are going to be shut down, okay? And then your parasympathetic nervous system, it says, hey, 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 you've been actually going really hard. Um, now it's time for you to slow down. So the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system, they kind of augment each other. The sympathetic nervous system goes crazy, crazy, crazy when it needs to, and the parasympathetic nervous system says, hey, we gotta slow down, let's take it back. Uh, we can't keep doing this, okay? So the, it kind of, um, they modulate each other, um, and they modulate each other so that we can um, keep adequate balance, okay? So now I'm going to move into neuroassessment, okay? And the most important um, things that we want to look at in neuroassessment uh, are if you want to see headache, loss of consciousness, dizziness, very important, okay? Uh, <clears throat> dysphagia, difficulty swallowing, dementia, difficulty with uh, memory, gait disturbances, uh, whether it's a uh, uh, spastic gait or scissor gait, what's going on, tremors, are we shaking for any reason, numbness or weakness, okay, pain, those are the things that we're going to do, uh, we're looking at in uh, um, a nerve uh, or a neuro patient to try to depict um, which part of the nervous system is being implicated in which disease process, okay, so history, 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 history. We talked about in the cardiovascular assessment how important history was. And we're going to say the same thing in the neurological assessment. 
neurological assessment, the history is of paramount importance because if you find out what the patient's normal levels are um, versus what they're coming in with, that can tell you if there's something acute going on or if this is an extension of something that they've had going on. Um, you also want to know the time of onset of the symptoms. Very crucial in the stroke patient who comes in and has that four um, hour window in order to get TPA um, or has that window to go to the IVR. Um, you want to know um, did this patient have dementia before? That's one of the first things someone comes in with um, altered mental status. You want to know what their baseline exam is. That's very important to establish. What's the baseline exam? That's the first question you should ask. Because you could be doing a whole lot of workup for someone who hatch actually is like this at baseline. So that's something that you have to find out immediately before you even try to even um, get any tests done. Because if this, you know, Let's say the family members are um, coming in now and saying, you know, he's confused. Well, the caretaker knows that the patient's been confused, but the family member may not know if they're not being around the patient. So you always want to ask who knows the patient, what, um, what is their baseline, okay, so before you start doing um, a crazy workup. Medications, what medications they're taking. Okay? That can actually alter pa um, patient's mental status. Um, if the patient comes in and you're suspecting a brain bleed, you want to know if the patient's on Coumadin, you want to know if the patient um, is on one of the factor 10 inhibitors, so like Ipixaban, uh, Rivaroxaban, or something like that. You want to know if they're on aspirin or Plavix. Very important to know, okay? Because you want to know if you have to reverse these things, okay? You want to know if this person taking opioids, can they um, be an opioid overdose if they come in with altered mental status. So it's very important to establish what medications this patient is taking. Vital signs and symptoms the patient presenting with and when did they start, okay? Uh, actually, what are the signs and symptoms and when did they start? Again, very important to establish time of onset um, with the symptoms, okay? Uh, <clears throat> neurological exam. You must do a thorough neural exam to properly identify and diagnose a neurological abnormality. A lot of times people um, go see a neurological ill patient and their neural exam is basically uh, who you are, where you are, where you um, um, they look at level of alertness and then they have motor and they have no cranial nerve examination. It is very important that you understand that this makes up the neurological exam. Mental status alertness, cranial nerve, motor sensory, reflexes, cerebellum, and, con and consider a mental exam if the person is altered um, and um, you're looking at whether they have some side components to it. Okay? Uh, mental status testing, um, you can use any one of these um, if you are working in a neurological clinic and you have to do an extensive neurological exam. The mini mental examination is free. Um, the rest of these, I think you have to have subscriptions to them. I think you have to pay some kind of fee. Um, but these are all um, tools that you can use to do a um, extensive neurological testing or mental status testing. Glasgow Coma Scale. We see this all the time in our patients. The Glasgow Coma Scale. Um, very important for you to remember the Glasgow Coma Scale because you're going to be testing on this. You're going to have a patient who comes in, um, who opens their eyes to pain or speech, um, who is confused and who only localizes to pain, um, and then you have to give you the best possible score. Remember, 15 is the best score you can get, 3 is the worst score that you can get, okay? Um, you have to know, eye opening, does the eye open spontaneously, which is 4? Um, do they open to speech, which is three? Do they open to pain, which is two? Do they not open at all, which is one? Okay. You want to make sure that you um, look at um, eye opening. Then you're going to look at verbal response. Okay. Are they oriented, um, which is five? Are they um, confused, which is four? Inappropriate words, three. Moans, two. Um, no speech, one. Okay. Motor exam. Do they follow commands, five? Localized to pain, um, I'm sorry, follows command six. Localized to pain, five. Withdraws to pain, four. Abnormal flexion, three. Abnormal extension, four, um, two. No movement at all is one. Okay. Uh, again, you can have three. Everything is none. 
and you can actually have um, 15, which is completely um, neurologically intact. Um, the threshold for intubation is GCS of 8 or less, okay? Um, I think the tr threshold for organ procurement um, in, in uh, this um, part of town is, um, I think, about 5 or, or, or 6, something like that, okay? Um, if patient's intubated, um, you can do uh, best possible score, and where um, when someone's intubated uh, is 10. Um, if they have a trach um, or intubated, you can use 10. Um, and um, worse is 2. Um, and that all depends um, uh, in if the patient's intubated or not. An intubated patient's really hard sometimes to even get it because you have to modify for the speech um, because they can communicate. But some people can actually follow commands, um, so um, that may make it a lot easier. So changes in consciousness, okay? So <clears throat> when you're looking at a patient who comes in with delirium, remember delirium is something acute, okay? Um, when we're looking at memory changes, um, delirium, um, you will have no recollection of immediate or past. Dementia, which is chronic, usually they can remember things, remember things from really long ago, but they can't remember things that were immediate. Um, so that's a lot um, where you go with the difference between delirium and dementia, okay? Delirium is usually an acute onset, a patient's in the hospital, or patient town has some kind of illness um, that's actually causing some encephalopathy, um, causing some um, um, mental status changes due to encephalopathy, due to whatever illness is going on, um, or the patient's in the OR or the ICU, um, they can have um, some delirium um, associated with their mental status changes. Brainstem lesions. Brainstem lesions um, can affect your cranial nerves. Remember, their cranial nerves are there. Can excel. So you're going to look at visual, um, nystagmus, double vision, nausea, vomiting, yawning. When you're seeing this in a neurologically ill patient, you want to think, okay, is this a brainstem lesion that's going on? Or if it's not a brainstem lesion, is the brainstem being compressed? Um, and um, that's what's causing these symptoms to happen. Okay? Encephalopathy are, are metabolic changes that occurs. Um, um, ammonia, if your liver is not working, um, you can't get rid of ammonia. Ammonia can cause toxic um, um, neurological symptoms. Um, kidney failure, um, you can't get rid of um, urea. Uh, your, uh, toxins um, can actually cause you to have um, some metabolic changes. Um, different toxins, if you take in uh, poisonous uh, um, um, substances, um, that can cause you to have encephalopathy. Ketoacidosis, um, too much sugar, um, can cause you to have some metabolic derangements. That can cause you to have an encephalopathy, um, which um, can result in altered mental status. Consciousness. Now, <clears throat> arousal and awareness are very different. I go into the room and I say, Tom, Tom, and Tom kind of moves and kind of opens up his eyes. Um, but then he goes back to sleep. Um, Tom is arousable, um, but when you ask Tom questions, Tom does not know who he is, he does not know where he is. That's arousal. Arousal is you can get the patient to wake up. Um, awareness is the patient know who he is, uh, where he is, why he's there, and stuff like that. So um, there's a difference between arousal and awareness. Arousal um, is a state of wakefulness. Awareness is actually knowing who you are, where you are, why you're there, and what's going on. Okay, um, it's almost like um, you you um, you wake up someone um, and you wake them up and they are able to talk to you. They're able to give you a good conversation. But then you wake someone else up and they're just they're just staring into space. They're not even looking at you.